Morning, church. How are we doing this morning? Hey, man, would you come up to your feet? Let's worship Jesus together this morning. Amen. Yes, Jesus, we praise you. You are worthy of our praise, God. We adore you, Jesus.
Well, I'm going to invite you guys to have a seat. Uh, we have uh, a special element of our service here today, and that's so that we have a couple baptisms uh, here at the 9 a.m. And we are really excited to witness uh, this proclamation of faith. Uh, here in New City, we don't believe there's anything magic in the water itself. It is literally just St. Charles City tap water. Um, and yet, it is deeply meaningful and deeply symbolic of a life uh, that shares in the life, death, and resurrection of Christ. Uh, when we dunk them in the water, it symbolizes being buried with Christ and then being risen to new life with Christ as well. And so there's co a couple things happening when we celebrate, when we practice the sacrament of baptism. One of the things that happening is that these uh, young people who are getting baptized today, they are declaring their faith in Jesus. And they're saying, I, before the public congregation, before their brothers and sisters in Christ, that we are followers of Jesus. Which is a beautiful thing, amen? Yes. But then also what's happening is you have a part to play in this as well. We often forget this, that you guys are witnesses to this proclamation of faith. So as a congregation, as a local church, you guys as witnesses are also saying, we are going to witness and we are going to come alongside and we are going to love and we are going to care for and we're going to pour out our lives as well for the people that are in our local church as the local body for these people who are saying we're a brother or we're a sister in Christ. And so don't miss your part in this as well. And in all this, we're just asking that Christ would be magnified that the Father would be glorified, that the Spirit would move in this moment, and that we would just tangibly feel the Spirit as the Spirit has already been working and shaping these people's lives through the regeneration of their hearts and through growing them in the love of their Savior. And so um, I'm going to invite uh, Noah to come forward at this time. This is Noah Case. He's our first one being baptized today. This is his older brother, Jack, as well. Hi, my name is Jack, and I'll be reading Noah's testimony for him today. I grew up in a Christian household. I've been going to church every week since I was born. And I've always told people that I was a Christian without truly knowing what it meant. Before I was a Christian, I believed that all it meant was to go to church every week, and that was all you needed to be saved. When I was 15, I came to realize that Christianity is more than that. I had to realize that I was a sinful person, and I had to ask God to forgive my sins, and I would follow him. I'm being baptized today as a public profession of my faith, and in recognition of what, is, of what God has done for my life and a commitment as, is, as a disciple of Jesus Christ. Noah, have you decided uh, to follow Jesus with your life? And have you accepted Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior? I baptize you in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Congrats, man. All right, next up we have Meredith Case, and Mylan is going to be reading her testimony. what communion was all about. They explained to me <clears throat> that 
It is a reminder that Jesus died on the cross for our sins. In order to become a Christian and be right with God, I had to repent from my sins and accept Jesus as my Savior. Later that week, on July 13th, 2020, I became a Christian. And finally today, I'm getting baptized. Meredith, have you decided to follow Jesus with your life? And have you accepted Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior? I baptize you in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Welcome uh, Elijah Case and Brett, uh, one of our other youth leaders, is going to be reading his testimony. Sorry. <laughs> All right, here's uh, Elijah's testimony. I grew up in a Christian household, but I didn't become a Christian until I was 14. Before then, I was a good kid and I hung out with good kids at school. I thought I was Christian because my parents were Christian. When I was 14, my parents sent me to a Christian running camp where I understood the gos- what the gospel meant for the first time. That week, I repented of my sin and I put my faith in Jesus Christ. Elijah, have you decided to follow Jesus with your life? Yes. And have you accepted Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior? I baptize you in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Congrats, man. All right, next up we have Beckett Meyer. Uh, his mom, Jenna, is going to be reading his testimony, and his dad, Tony, is going to be baptizing him. Well, I remember standing on the stage a few years ago and dedicating to raise our children in the ways of the Lord with our church's help. And we are just so excited to be standing here today, getting to celebrate Beckett's decision to follow Jesus. So Beckett's seven years old, and he said, I want to live with Jesus and to have eternal life with him. And I know it will be the right path. Would you come up to your feet again, church? And let's celebrate Jesus and celebrate these lives that have decided to follow Jesus. Amen. We praise you, Jesus. Hallelujah.
Jesus. Thank you for this moment, Lord. Thank you for this lives that publicly declare that you are the Lord, Jesus, that you are the Lord of their lives. Lord, we are so thankful for what you're doing in this place. We are so thankful, Holy Spirit, for you are with us right now. We adore you, Jesus. We love you. 
Amen, 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 church. You may have a seat, amen, hallelujah. Good morning. Good morning. What a great Sunday to get together and witness several baptisms this morning. That was really beautiful. Um, I have a few announcements for us today. The first thing is for signing day on May 19th. This is for our city students who are entering um, grades 6 through 12 in the fall. Um, it is an opportunity for them to commit to a specific ministry for a year and for the church to gather around and cheer them on and um, just encourage them and to pray over them. Um, and then afterwards, we will have um, food trucks and games outside. So it'll be a fun time for everybody. Uh, if you're a student who's planning to commit to that signing day time, we do need you to register. But if you're just planning to attend to cheer them on and hang out outdoors, you do not need to register. Uh, the other thing coming up is 636 Day is coming up. This is an event in St. Charles um, that just kind of celebrates our city. It'll be on June 1st this year, and our church is partnering with the city um, as a way to volunteer and serve uh, and love our city. So if you would like to serve um, at that specific event, there's two different time slots, so you'll still be able to have some fun at 636 Day. There's food trucks and music and all sorts of fun. Um, but if you would like to volunteer to kind of help serve and love our city, please register online. And if you register by May 20th, you will get a free t-shirt. Very exciting. So uh, you could look forward to that. But we hope you're able to join us for this event. It's a city event. It's a great time to meet your neighbors, to meet um, just the local people in St. Charles, um, but also to love and serve our city um, by volunteering. And last, if you are new, um, we're glad you're here today. If you would like to get to know us better or you have questions about our church, our welcome desk is in the back here, uh, and you can go stop back there, uh, and we are happy to serve you and answer any questions you may have. So, thanks. Good morning. What a glorious day, huh? Um, I'm going to share some scripture. If you guys could stand and join me, I would appreciate that. So reading from Luke 23 today. Two others who were criminals were led away to be put to death with him. And when they came to the place that is called the skull, there they crucified him and the criminals, one on his right and one on his left. And Jesus said, Father, Forgive them, for they know not what they do. And they cast lots to divide his garments. And the people stood by watching, but the rulers scoffed at him, saying, He saved others, let him save himself, if he is the Christ of God, his chosen one. You may be seated. Lord God, thanks so much for this day. Thanks so much for what you're doing in the lives of the people that are gathered here. Lord, we ask for your encouragement and your challenge and all of the things that you do in us. Um, Lord, we just think of you on the cross. We think of that environment and all of the things that were going on. And, and Lord, we're humbled and just amazed at, at what gift you've given us uh, in the way that's played out in our lives. Lord, um, be with Chris this morning as he delivers us the word, and um, just glorify yourself in this place and in the people that are gathered here. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Thanks, Ed. So in the first century there was a guy named Paul. And Paul is on trial before a Jewish council, and he has been falsely accused, and he has been falsely arrested. And Paul, a couple of things you should know about him, he is a Roman citizen, he is a follower of Jesus, and he has a history of violence in punishing those who would be against him. In Paul, in this moment, we're going to see in this corrupt trial, of, in this kangaroo court, if you will, has a response to the corrupt authorities 
around him. Acts 23.1 says this, And looking intently at the council, Paul said, Brothers, I've lived my life before God in all good conscience up until this day. And the high priest Ananias commanded those who stood by him to strike him on the mouth. Not a, that's not allowed according to Jewish law or because he's a Roman citizen. Then Paul said to him, God is going to strike you, you whitewashed wall. Are you sitting to judge me according to the law? And yet, contrary to the law, you order me to be struck? And those who stood by said, would you revile God's high priest? And Paul said, I did not know, brothers, that he was the high priest. For it is written, you shall not speak evil of a ruler of your people. So Paul does the strangest thing here. He's in this corrupt trial. He's being smacked on the face. He's being struck unlawfully. And then a Roman man who knows the law all too well in the first century does the craziest thing. He apologizes. He says, my bad. Let me take that one back. Can I get a mulligan? Didn't know he was the high priest and the ruler of our people. And it's not like Paul didn't know how to retaliate. He knew how to retaliate quite well. He oversaw the death of Stephen. And all Stephen did for that was perform miracles for the people and have a disagreement with the religious leaders of his day of whom Paul was one. So we have to ask ourselves a question about this ex-Pharisee Roman man who asked for forgiveness in a corrupt moment after being struck unlawfully. What has happened to Paul? What has made Paul a person who is able to control his words and his desire for revenge? Why does Paul relate differently to his enemies than he used to? What has gone on in this life? Hold on to that question. Now, I just want to remind us where we've been a bit as we've been in the Sermon on the Mount over the last couple of weeks. We have seen that Jesus has told us what kind of people pursue the kingdom of God and the blessings that are in store for those who pursue the kingdom of God. We have also seen that those who seek the kingdom of God are not just given an identity, but they're given a mission to be light and salt in a world of darkness and decay. And all along the way, Jesus has not undone the teaching of the law or the prophets in the Old Testament, but rather has dusted off the true meaning of these teachings while also naming the distortions in his day that the pastors of his day had wrought on the people so that they looked like sheep without a shepherd. And so Jesus is doing all three of these things all throughout the Sermon on the Mount. And today, we get to see Jesus in the second half of the You Have Heard It Said, But I Say to You statements. And in these statements, Jesus is specifically doing a couple things. Jesus is naming the cultural voices of his day. He's looking around and he's naming the distortions in the culture. Jesus then offers a better way, a truer righteousness that actually surpasses that of the scribes and Pharisees because it's not that of a whitewashed wall or tomb. It is legitimate. It doesn't just appear nice and reek of death on the inside. It's legitimate. And then Jesus is raising the bar for behavior in the kingdom. He's narrowing out, he's winnowing out the distortions that the people practice in his day so that there's a narrower view of what is true and right of loving God, loving people, and making disciples. Think about it like this. Jesus in the Sermon on the Mount in many ways with the teachings of the law and of the prophets is he's restoring an antique. Um, my mother inherited a turn-of-the-century hall tree. Now, if you know anything about antiques, you know that a little bit after the turn of the century, um, people started doing horrendous things to antiques to preserve them. They started putting black varnish and lacquer on everything to try to extend the life. And so what they did is they covered up these incredibly beautiful pieces of wood that were tiger oak that um, were beautiful underneath. And so what my mom did is she inherited this antique, and the first thing she did is she removed it from the dusty environment in the damp environment in which it had been stored, and she stored it in a proper place, and then she stripped off all the black varnish, revealing the beautiful tiger oak underneath, and then polished and did all the proper things to restore it to its proper glory. That's what Jesus is doing here. 
with the teaching of the law and the prophets. He is removing all the distortions and the black varnish of what the religious leaders of his day had put on the teachings of the law and the prophets, and he's restoring through fulfillment the proper use in what these laws and teachings of the prophets were aimed to do. Now, as we look in the text, if you've read ahead, you know that oaths and vows are up next. Now, if you were here last Sunday when we talked about things like anger and lust and divorce, you might think, okay, uh, we'll have a little bit easier go of it here today. Maybe Jesus is taking a breather. Maybe he's taking a rest. But Jesus actually takes our words quite seriously. God spoke the universe into existence. Satan twisted words to bring about the fall. At Mount Sinai, God tells his people who they are and who he is. And the good news of the kingdom is spread through what? Verbal proclamation. So words matter a lot to Jesus. And honesty matters and sincerity matters. So Jesus isn't taking a breather here. He's pressing into something that's equally as important and equally hard to master. As James tells us, everything on the earth has been merely mastered, but the human tongue, who can master that? And so here we go, Matthew 5, 33 through 37. Again, you have heard that it was said of those of old, you shall not swear falsely, but shall perform to the Lord what you have sworn. But I say to you, do not take an oath at all, either by heaven, for it is the throne of God, or by the earth, for it is the footstool, or by Jerusalem, for it is the city of the great king. And do not take an oath by your head, for you cannot make one hair white or black. Let what you say be simply yes or no. Anything more than this comes from evil. So oaths and vows in ancient Israel were meant to promote truthfulness by invoking something greater than yourself when you were making some kind of promise or contractual deal. It meant to say that you were serious. Um, When I was a little kid playing on the playground at my school, you would hear little children swear by their mother's name or their grandfather's grave, which, if you think back on it, is an extremely dark thing to be swearing on for little kids. But this was the way. And what it meant is, I'm deadly serious about this thing, even though little kids probably don't know what they're saying in that. But in Jesus' day, they would swear on things like heaven or earth or Jerusalem, and these oaths were often long, elaborate, and confusing speeches. And people would use them as an opportunity to fool someone, to trick someone by sounding serious, but in reality, they were planning to deceive and backstab all the while this long, elaborate, and confusing speech was being thrown out there. But something you would never do is swear an oath or a vow in the name of Yahweh. Invoking this name was binding, and whatever price was vowed had to be paid. And so people in Jesus' day are trying to sidestep invoking the name of Yahweh by swearing on these other things so that they aren't technically breaking a law, but they're still in a position where they can deceive by sounding serious. And it got so legalistic and it got, there was so much black varnish on this law that in Jesus' day, people would say, if you swear towards Jerusalem, it's binding. But if you're not facing Jerusalem and you swear something on Jerusalem, it's not binding. And people were just getting lost in all the minutia of what was going on. And so Jesus is aware of what the law says, and he's aware of how it's being misused. And so Jesus offers us a new way. He says, don't use these vows or these oaths for dishonest gain. You are to be a people of honesty. You are to be a people of sincerity. People should be able to trust what you say as kingdom seekers, as the people of God, without having to conjure any kind of oath or any kind of vow. See, the teachings of the law and prophets that were intended for the flourishing and honesty of Israel have been distorted. And so Jesus is narrowing the scope of the proper use of oaths and vows. And he's heightening the command to faithfulness. And the rules and the misuses of this teaching are not to be used among those who are followers of Jesus. So what is the antidote that Jesus offers for this kind of dishonesty? Well, Jesus simply tells us to be truth tellers. Our yes should mean yes and our no should mean no. And those who are seeking the kingdom should be honest enough, sincere enough, truthful enough that not only do you not ever need an oath 
in normal everyday life, but if you are in the court of law and for some reason do need some kind of oath, it can be trusted. And those outside the church should never have to feel like the people of God are trying to pull one over on them or trying to manipulate them or trying to trick them. Our witness is wisely walking towards outsiders, as Paul says, should be that of honesty. And so to overpromise or to embellish is to actually reflect who? Well, it's actually to reflect the nature of the enemy. It's actually to reflect the evil one because does he not overpromise the rewards of sin to us? Does he not embellish? Does he not just say, no, partake, look, taste, touch? I promise it's good for you. You'll enjoy it. You can be like God. The enemy is the ultimate liar. And so when we lie, we reflect the enemy. And you might be thinking, well, I haven't really made any oaths or vows lately. Should be good. Or I only tell little white lies that won't hurt anyone. But remember, Jesus' teachings here are not about how far our hearts can take us to the line without stepping over it. That's the function of the Pharisees. That's the function of the you have heard it said of Jesus' day. They're trying to circumvent the proper teaching of the law and prophets. They're trying to sidestep faithfulness and genuine regeneration of their hearts by just playing a game, playing pretend spirituality. Let's dress up and play pretend spirituality. So this is not about how far can our hearts take us to the line without stepping over it. The Sermon on the Mount is about addressing the lines in our hearts that our hearts are constantly crossing. Whether you're aware of it or not, Jesus is drawing us in, inviting us in to see that, yeah, it's cute if you don't commit homicide or adultery or take a lie in an oath, but what I'm actually telling you to do is actually don't lust or actually put your anger to death. Actually have honesty in your heart. And so for us, we might rarely take an oath, but we are constantly tempted to what? We're constantly tempted to make ourselves look good in the stories that we tell, just a little embellishment and a little polish here and there, to exaggerate about those who we don't care for. It's easy for our enemies or that coworker we can't stand or that first cousin that drives us crazy to just embellish just a little bit so that we come out looking like we are the right ones in the stories that we tell. To downplay our mistakes or to delegate our mistakes and our responsibility to the failure of others. To make up reasons for our behavior. Well, this and that happened, and so I was justified in this. See, like the Pharisees, it's easy for us to downplay our own brokenness and play up the brokenness of others. But Jesus is warning us against this very clearly. Jesus is making it clear that throughout the whole Sermon on the Mount, that the Pharisees are the ones who deceive others about their spirituality, and it should not be so for those within the household of God. Jesus takes our words incredibly seriously. In Acts 5, there's the story of Ananias and Sapphira, different Ananias than the council member. This Ananias and Sapphira are um, early followers of Jesus, but they do a very grave and grievous thing. They're in a moment where everyone is being incredibly generous. And in Acts 5, everyone is selling their possessions and they're giving all that they have to the communal body of the church and its existence in that point in history. And Ananias and Sapphira, they come forward and they sell their piece of property and they hold back some of the gains, but they make it sound like they're giving all of it. So they hold back, you know, maybe 25% in their savings account, and they give 75% to the apostles, but they say they give 100%. Now, this was not commanded of them by the law. The apostles do not ask them to do this. No one is asking them to lie. No one is asking for them to give 100%, but they want to look like they're giving 100%. They want the perception in the view of the apostles to be favorable for them. And so what happens is Ananias, after lying to the apostles, is struck dead. And his wife Sapphira comes in afterwards. She doesn't know that he's been struck dead in his life, and she's struck dead. 
And sometimes we forget that tragic stories of the judgment of God are not reserved for the Old Testament. And the same power and the same spirit that rose, rose Jesus Christ from the dead, from his grave, also put Ananias and Sapphira in theirs. And so Jesus Christ takes our words very seriously. And here's why this is so important for our souls. Um, when we feel the need to be dishonest about ourselves or others so that we look or seem a certain way, here's what we're actually saying. What we're actually saying is that the cross is not enough. That our identity and our value and our worth that is demonstrated in the death, resurrection, and life of Jesus in the cross is not enough. And so I've got to add to it. You see, when we embellish about ourselves, what's really happening is to say, okay, Jesus, your cross has got me to this point of understanding myself, but let me take it from there because I'm pretty great. And, and I've got to work these stories so that other people know this. And so we need to do more to show our worth and our value. And so the white lies take root beneath the cracks and they grow and they give birth to all sorts of unhealthy things and relating to ourselves and others. And eventually it distorts how we see ourselves and others in our view of the world. So Jesus is warning us against this. Now, it doesn't mean that we never take an oath. Maybe in a court of law we need to. And God actually takes oaths throughout the Bible, not because he needs to hold himself accountable from deceit, but because he wants people to know and believe that he is serious about what he says. And so Jesus is using hyper, hyperbolic language to get his point across, which we'll see with the other U.S. Heard It Said statements, which is very common for Jesus in his preaching and teaching. He's trying to get it to stick in their brains. So that's taking oaths and vows. Now, then we get to retaliation. Matthew 5, 38, you have heard it said, an eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth. But I say to you, do not resist the one who is evil. But if anyone slaps you on the right cheek, turn to him the other also. And if anyone would sue you and take your tunic, let him have your cloak as well. And if anyone forces you to go a mile, go with him two miles. Give to the one who begs from you and do not refuse the one who bids borrow from you. So what do we see in the Old Testament law here? Well, an eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth was set up for Israel, specifically for the time of the judges and for a, a judge to enact this. And it's a policy that ancient Israel would use for their judiciary system. And what this law was meant to provide was a de-escalation of retribution, of retaliation, of revenge. So if I took your tooth, you couldn't take my arm. If I broke your leg, you couldn't burn my house down. If I stole a loaf of bread from you, you couldn't take my entire herd. Are we tracking with this? So an eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth, the intent of the law is actually not to say someone takes your tooth, you make sure you go take theirs. It's actually to say, you better not take more than a tooth. Don't you dare. Because when you're dealing with small tribal units and close family units, retaliation could escalate incredibly quickly. And so it's meant to prevent escalation. And the whole point of the law was what? Proportional justice. Proportional justice. That was the whole point of the law. That's what Israel was to embody. Proportionality. And then Jesus says the wildest thing. Do not resist the evil one. Now, imagine you're a first century Jewish person listening to Jesus teach on the Sermon on the Mount. You are something that most of us cannot relate to. You are a minority in a culture that is under the thumb of the world power of its day. And now Jesus is telling you, don't resist the evil one. Jesus, haven't we been through enough what Rome has put us through? But our culture would have been as perplexed as their culture with not resisting the evil one and not um, wanting to pursue retaliation or vengeance. See, we live in a culture that celebrates and loves vengeance. Do we not? We love vengeance. Do you want evidence of this? Um, there is four John Wick movies. 
there is three Taken movies. There are seven movies between John Wick and Taken. And if you haven't seen those movies, something bad happens to an attractive or good person. A friend of that person goes on a bloodthirsty killing spree to avenge or rescue that person. And then they rescue that person and we celebrate. That's essentially the plot of all these movies. Um, We also love listening to Taylor Swift. And what does she do? She is implicitly getting revenge on all of her exes and the men that have wronged her in her life, not just through the lyrics, but also through her record sales. No one can touch her right now. And so we love this story of triumph. Um, I've, in my personal story, I have thrown a baseball at someone as hard as I possibly could, which is not very hard, mid-80s, at someone's rib cage because they hit one of my teammates, and I felt it was uncalled for. And so there's nothing like a two-seamer with a little run right in the second rib. It bruises really well. And so in my personal story, I've had to also learn that vengeance is not good. So Jesus in the moment, he's teaching us that revenge is not the way we relate to our enemies or those who do evil things to us. Instead, Jesus is teaching us to relate to others in what? Not in retaliation, but in love rather than resistance. And he gives us a couple examples. He says a slap on the right cheek. Now, this slap is a backhanded slap. Most people are right-handed. It's the right side of your face. Um, These are actually different words in the Greek. So a left cheek strike is violence. A right cheek strike is an insult. And Jesus is not saying never to take measures to escape violence, not to flee or to um, report to the authorities, but he is saying don't return the insult. Don't escalate. Take the backhanded insult. Endure this insult over and over again without retaliation. And then he talks about having your tunic taken, because who doesn't hate it when their tunic is taken? Now, this is a hyperbolic statement, but let's not dilute the principle. Jesus is not asking us to give up the last of our clothes, which in the ancient world, guess how many pairs of clothes you had? One and run through the streets naked. That actually was unlawful and unfitting for the Jewish people at the time. He's not asking us to do that. But he is saying when someone wrongs you, kill them with kindness. It's like heaping coals on their head. Even go a step further. He says when you're forced to go a mile, go two more. And really, if you're doing the addition in the Greek there, it's actually go three miles total. And that practice was actually common. Any Roman soldier in the first century could come up to you at any point in your life and say, hey, I've got some heavy armor and weapons I need transported to the next town over. You carry them for me. This verb in the Greek is the same exact verb that is given to Simon of Cyrene when he carries the cross of Jesus. Why does Simon of Cyrene carry the cross of Jesus? Because he has to. Because a Roman is telling him to. And so when you're hearing this as a first century Jew in the Sermon on the Mount, you're instantly thinking about all the times that Roman soldiers have made you carry their crap to the next town over. And Jesus is saying, take it even on those mounds. Um, Then he says, give. He says, be generous. Now, interest-free loans were assumed. This was the way of Israel. But even beyond interest-free loans, Jesus is saying, be generous. Um, give to the beggar who's not even taking a loan because they would never even take a loan because they could never pay you back. Give to the people who can never pay you back. So we get all these hyperbolic statements, but don't dilute the meaning of them. They're meant to be powerful. They're meant to strike us in a way. Jesus is saying the new way we relate to everyone is love. So we ask the question, is there ever a time to resist evil? Well, of course, but how do we resist evil? By relating in love. Galatians 2.11, but when Cephas, that's Peter, came to Antioch, I opposed him to his face. This is Paul writing, because he stood condemned. For before certain men came from James, he was eating with the Gentiles. But when they came, he drew back and separated himself, fearing the circumcision party. And the rest of the Jews acted hypocritically along with him, so that even Barnabas was led astray by their hypocrisy. But when I saw that their conduct was not in step with the truth of the gospel, I said to Cephas before them all, If you, though a Jew, live like a Gentile and not like a Jew, how can you force the Gentiles to live like a Jew? So Paul, in this moment, 
has seen the hypocrisy and the lack of love in Peter. Even Barnabas, Paul's mentor, was led astray. And Paul, this is famously known as the Antioch incident, Paul opposes Peter to his face. Why? Because Peter has lost his love for the Gentile believers and has become a hypocrite because his self-perception has been more important than them receiving the good news of Jesus well. And so Paul, in relating in love, confronts in a loving way, in a peaceful way, not a backhanded, retaliatory way, but he confronts in love for the sake of love, not for the sake of vengeance or retaliation or his own pride. See, Jesus is not naive that evil is real. And he knew the kingdom of Israel for a time, because of their disobedience and their hardness of heart, had to operate in an eye for an eye way. And he knows he's teaching to a minority people under the thumb of the Roman Empire. He knows that evil is real. He's calling what is evil, evil. He's not showing weakness here. Jesus, throughout the entire Sermon on the Mount, is implicitly or explicitly judging the religious leaders of his day and declaring that they are evil in the ways that they've perverted the laws of the teaching and the prophets. But with the coming of the greater kingdom, his kingdom, retaliation is no longer the way to relate. Love is. And in love, sometimes we do resist evil. But most of the time, we don't flinch. And we turn the other cheek. And this isn't weakness. It is power. Imagine that you went up to someone and you swung on them. You threw a punch. The strongest punch you could ever throw, all your body weight's behind it, and you strike them right in the jaw, and they don't flinch. They just stand there, and they look at you, and then they turn the other cheek. We would not call that weakness. At that point, you should be afraid because your best punch has done nothing to the person you struck. In 1965, there was a march of civil rights activists that started from an African Methodist Episcopal church from Selma, and they marched to Montgomery. And to get to Montgomery, they had to cross a bridge. And this bridge shared the name with the Grand Master of the Ku Klux Klan at the time. And they've got to cross this bridge to get to Montgomery. And the governor of Alabama at the time told the state patrol by whatever means necessary, you do not let them cross that bridge. You do not let them get to Montgomery. Martin Luther King from his church in Georgia wrote to these people in Alabama. He said, by any means necessary, you do not retaliate. You take it and you turn the other cheek and you cross that bridge and don't flinch. And don't for one instance show anger. And they marched across that bridge, and they were beaten and they were struck, women, women and men alike, beaten unconscious by any means necessary, by orders of the governor or to the state patrol. And that has famously been known now as Bloody Sunday. And those images were captured by local camera crews, and they were spread to the entire country. And a lot of civil rights historians will argue that's the linchpin. That's the turning point when all of the other people in the country started to bear righteous anger for the oppression that was bearing down on Martin Luther King Jr. and his followers. It's not weakness to turn the other cheek. It's actually the greatest power you can display through the transformed life. Enemy love calls it. And here's the last statement from Jesus. Matthew 5, 43, you have heard it said that you shall love your neighbor and hate your enemy, but I say to you, love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you so that you may be sons of your Father who is in heaven. For he makes the sun rise on the evil and on the good, and he sends, sends rain on the just and the unjust. For if you love those who love you, what reward do you have? Do not even the tax collectors do the same? And if you greet only your brothers, what more are you doing than others? Do not even the Gentiles do the same. You, therefore, must be perfect as your heavenly Father is perfect. 
So Jesus says, you have heard it said, you shall love your neighbor. That's in the Old Testament, right? Somewhere? Yes. Nod your head, yes. <laughs> Even if you're uncertain, just start nodding your head, yes. That's in the Old Testament. Love your neighbor. Here's what's not in the Old Testament, not once. And hate your enemy. So the hate of your enemy has developed in Israel throughout its history in the intertestamental period and into the era of the Pharisees ruling in the Sanhedrin. It's nowhere to be found in the Old Testament, but here it is in the cultural voice of his day. It's a teaching going around in the first century. In fact, uh, Qumran, the place where we dug up all those Dead Sea Scrolls, the Qumran community did teach, hate your enemy. And so we have scripts that say, love your neighbor, but hate your enemies from Qumran. And if the parable of the Good Samaritan shows us anything, it's that Israel at the time, they didn't even want to consider love for certain people, undesirables in the region, their neighbor. So Jesus rebukes the distortion of the law in his day, and he points back to neighbor love, because even our enemies are our neighbors. And then if you, and you ask me, Jesus, he takes it a step way too far, and he actually asks us to pray against those who persecute us. Now at this point, Chris struggles with this. I don't know, Jesus. That seems a little too far. Uh, because I want to go by the old adage, yeah, I'm not going to hate them or I won't attack them or anything, but I'm not going to like them. And I have to pray for them. That means I actually have to be concerned for their well-being. That's a tough one. But Jesus points out the other way doesn't mean anything. He says even tax collectors love their moms. Right? Right? Even tax collectors, those who were famous for betraying their own people by taxing their own people to death for the sake of Rome, they're Benedict Arnold's. That's what tax collectors are. Even they love their moms and the other tax collectors. So you're not getting any points for loving those who love you. And Jesus is making clear that in the kingdom, those of the kingdom do more. Those of the kingdom don't reflect the enemy or humanity. Those of the kingdom are to reflect our heavenly Father, imperfectly as it is. My first cousin, Michael, who I'm really close to, he, w- he lived in San Diego for a time, and we went out to visit him. And in San Diego, the San Diego Padres sponsor all of the local little kids' sports leagues. And so you see all these little Padres running around, and they have all the uniforms and the alternate uniforms and the digicamo uniforms and all these different uniforms. And I'll tell you what, the baseball's not great because they're eight. And so they are imperfectly reflecting the actual San Diego Padres. But you, you know whose team they're on, and you know who they root for, and they know what, you know what jersey they're wearing. The same for us. We're going to imperfectly reflect the Father. Jesus knows this. Be perfect is hyperbole, but he's saying that's still the target. And you should live in a way which everyone knows whose jersey you are wearing. Um, the biblical commentator, Plummer, he says this, evil for good is devilish, Good for good is human. Good for evil is divine. So we started with the question, why does Paul relate to his enemies different than he used to? Because his Lord does. That's why. At Sinai, the people were given instructions that would inform them who they were to be. The same thing is true for the Sermon on the Mount, this time with the 12, not with the 12 tribes, written with laws on stone, but with the 12 disciples, with the laws written on their hearts of flesh. And these teachings aren't ethical fables. They are identity markers of those who have received the kingdom of God. See, in fact, years prior to Paul, Jesus found himself in nearly the identical situation that we started off our time here this morning with. John 18, 22, when he had said these things, one of the officers standing by struck Jesus with his hand saying, is that how you answer the high priest? And Jesus answered him, if what I said is wrong, bear witness about the wrong, but if what I said is right, why do you strike me? And Annas then sent them to be bound to Caiaphas, the high priest. So Jesus, like Paul, unjust trial, trumped up charges, kangaroo court, is in, they're sitting before the council, the tribunal, the Sanhedrin, and he gets struck unlawfully And there's no wrong that they can bring against Jesus. Um, And Jesus, unlike Paul, doesn't rise up in anger. 
And unlike Paul, he does not apologize. Jesus turns the other cheek and the father turns his face away and the ultimate example of enemy love is displayed through the cross. How is the ultimate example of enemy love displayed through the cross? It's not even so much that he died at the hands of Romans or the corrupt Jewish leaders. That's true. But he also died for me and you. And before we were followers of Jesus, we were enemies of the kingdom of God. And so we can throw stones at the Sanhedrin in Rome all day, um, but we were actually the enemies of God that Jesus died to put down and to reconcile into sons and daughters of the Most High King. See, Jesus dies praying for those who persecute him. Father, forgive them. They know not what they do. And the evil of the serpent that would bruise his heel is crushed under the perfect obedience of the Son. Because like his father, he was perfect to the point of death. And so how can Paul do a 180 in the middle of an unjust trial? It's because his Savior showed him the way in his trial before him. And through the Sermon on the Mount, through the life, death, and resurrection of Jesus, we are taught not just the behavior of the kingdom and how to love our enemies, but this deeply comes from a well of understanding that we were the enemies, and we were died for. And yet while we were still sinners, Jesus died for us. And through the overflow and abundance of understanding this beautiful truth, this beautiful, wondrous mystery that is the good news of Jesus, through the Spirit, and maybe like Paul, after a little flare-up of anger, we too will slowly, step by step, walk in the perfect ways of our Father. We will love our enemies, not for the sake of bearing witness to ourselves in the ways in which we are ethical, but wearing, bearing witness to the kingdom and its king in the beautiful laws and teachings of that king. Let's pray. Lord, Heavenly Father, we give thanks for your word. We give thanks for the Sermon on the Mount. We give thanks for the teachings of Jesus. And we give thanks uh, that you, in your infinite wisdom, mercy, goodness, kindness, and slow to angerness, chose not to annihilate and wipe out the enemies before your eyes, those who had rebelled and sinned against your law. Instead, you first loved us through sending your son for us. And instead of us on the cross paying the price that we should have, it's your son. And in his trial and in his final prayers, he shows us that there is an enemy love that is powerful, that is strong, that shames evil practices that makes it obvious who's on the wrong team, that makes it obvious what the distortion of our vengeance and our revenge cultural moment is. It's petty, and it's actually weak. So Lord, help us through your spirit, through submission to your word, and through love of our Savior to walk in the ways of your kingdom Would the Sermon on the Mount not just be cute parables or fables for us to which we could be just a little bit nicer or kinder or forgiving, but would they actually um, be to us the beautiful teachings of a king who has won victory for his kingdom and leads us into a new, renewed, and fresh life in that kingdom and our behavior spreads the flourishing of that kingdom to a lost and a broken and a decaying world that so desperately needs them. Lord, we pray all these things in Jesus Christ's holy and precious name and all God's people said, amen. Amen, church. Would you come up to your feet? Sweet. Sing this song. I trust in God.
Jesus is mine. He's been my fourth man in the fire, time after time. Born of His Spirit, washed in His. It's more than enough Not trusting God My Savior The one Who will never fail He will never fail Not trusting God My Savior
with our benediction here today. Uh, here at New City Church, if you feel comfortable, we invite you to raise your hands in a posture of receiving for the benediction, and I'm going to ask that the Lord would send us out well in his power and his love and his truth out of these doors here this morning. Lord, Heavenly Father, here we are as a gathered people of God, and in a few short moments, we will be the scattered people of God. So scatter us well to our homes and our hobbies and our places of work the places in which you will randomly have us be this week? Would you put divine appointments in front of us this week? Would you give us a word of life-giving truth when we need it? Would you give us a posture of hospitality and love? And would you give us a strength to turn the other cheek so that we may be perfect like our Father who is in heaven is perfect? Lord, help us to not confuse the things of our day that are called weakness when they are indeed strength in the kingdom of God. Lord, send us out of this place so that our square inch of the world in which you have entrusted to us, St. Charles City and County and our region, would we be a people who are not just image bearers, but Christ followers, and that we would follow you in the way of our words, in the ways that we are tempted to retaliate. Would our witness be an oddity in our cultural moment, and would people see nothing other than the crucified Christ and the resurrected Messiah who has gone before us and taught us and shaped us and transformed us into these ways. We pray this in Jesus Christ's holy and precious name. And all God's people said, amen. Amen. Y'all have a great... In the hallway, we give thanks for that and go with God. See you guys.